Well, thank you for joining us in our Restoration History Series. I really appreciate your interest and those who have come and those who are a part of what we're going to be doing together over the uh, next quarter. Uh, as we think about uh, Restoration History, we're going to this evening to begin with the first lesson and try to uh, set the stage uh, so that we might understand a historical context, a political context, religious context in which to understand these things. We have a big challenge this evening uh, because we're going to be trying to survey uh, 15 centuries of history up to about uh, uh, A.D. 1500. Uh, the point is that as we begin, there is a flow uh, to history, there is a flow to culture, and there uh, is um, the possibility historically of um, understanding the development of thought patterns. And to understand then wh where we are today, uh, we must try to think about the development of those uh, thought uh, patterns and uh, religious, uh, philosophic, uh, and scientific uh, concepts. Beginning in Rome, much of Roman thought around the time of Christ was heavily influenced and was shaped in many ways by uh, Greek thinking. Uh, the Greeks had tried to build uh, a strong society upon the city-state, upon the polis, uh, and the values that were established within the culture and within uh, the context of the day uh, were established with reference to the uh, society or to the city-state. Uh, Socrates then, faced with uh, death or exile uh, from that which gave life meaning, uh, would obviously choose to die rather than to be excluded from the society. Later, the Greeks and Romans uh, both uh, sought to build society on their gods, but the gods were not divine and were merely amplified humanity. The Greeks and the Romans after them had no infinite God and thus had no sufficient reference point uh, for developing thinking and living. And really, when all is said and done, legislating uh, the moral life and the family life values failed, even though there were impressive legal reforms and uh, some uh, very interesting welfare programs because the human gods were an insufficient base. Eventually, as we will see, Rome fell. In contrast, the Christians, uh, beginning with uh, an infinite uh, God, had absolute universal values by which to live and by which to judge the society. These values were the foundation for human dignity and uh, human value. And the Christians were thus the enemies of Rome. We must try to understand why. The Christians were not killed because they worshiped Jesus, but because they were rebels against the state. They were rebellious because they worshiped Jesus as God and as uh, worshipers of the uh, infinite personal God, limiting their worship, worshiping only that infinite personal God. The, the, the Caesars could not tolerate uh, that kind of uh, competitiveness uh, because no authoritarian state can tolerate those who have an absolute uh, value system uh, by which to judge the state and its actions. So that's historically the circumstance in which we find ourselves in the time of, of uh, the Roman Empire. And even though Constantine eventually ended the persecution when Christianity became a legal religion, in 313 A.D. and ultimately the official state religion of the empire in 381 A.D., the majority of the citizens of the empire continued in their old ways. In fact, many who have studied the history of that period of time have observed that uh, the effort eventually diluted uh, the Christianity and its value system. Social life came to be exalted above the intellectual and officially sponsored art became more and more decadent, the music also, and in a general sense, apathy prevailed. All of that then can be summarized to say that Rome did not fall because of any external invasion, but because there was not a sufficient base upon which to build society. The barbarians only seized the opportunity afforded by the internal weakness that was inherent in Rome. Coming to the Middle Ages and thinking for a few moments about uh, the next, we could say, almost millennium of uh, history, the breakdown of Rome and the subsequent invasions were a time of social, political, and intellectual turmoil. In contrast to leaders within the early Christian church, uh, leaders like Ambrose of Milan uh, or Augustine, uh, 
who emphasized biblical teachings in Christianity, there was an increasing distortion generally away from the teachings of Scripture. The importance of um, the people, uh, the value uh, that was seen uh, in uh, individuals was diminished. And also there was a developing concept of spirituality that tended to set aside uh, the realities of the day. The result was that uh, the Christianity set forth in the New Testament was distorted and a, a strong humanistic element was being added uh, generally in the practice of the church. This was most obvious in the fact that the authority of the church increasingly took precedence over the teaching of the Bible. Uh, there were various new cultural elements that provided alternatives uh, so that uh, the culture could really, in, in no sufficient sense, be called Christian or biblical. The Middle Ages were a time uh, in which we can generally see the continuing response, um, and that was to mix the secular and the Christian. So we talk about the Middle Ages, there are various ways of describing the time period, but I'm probably going to uh, use a time period more or less uh, from 500 A.D. to about 1400. And despite the fact that during that period of time the church was providing hospitals and uh, charitable institutions, uh, the integration of the church and state provided a new problem. The state, whether it is strong or weak, has always uh, posed a problem to the church, especially in areas of basic morality. And during the medieval period, the intermingling of church and state resulted in the fact that Christian baptism came to have not only a spiritual significance, but also a social and a political significance. Because baptism denoted entrance into the society. A person was a, a member of the society, a member of the state, because they were baptized and were a part of the church. It's interesting that during that period of time, Jews were non-persons in that particular sense because they were not baptized and thus they did not have that typical entrance into the society. If the church baptized or consecrated the state in one sense, that only worsened the dilemma because the government that appears to support uh, the belief system of the society can betray that society with greatest impunity. And the church had tremendous difficulty during this period of time because of the integration of the church and state, because of the interaction of the church and state, the church had tremendous difficulty be being salt to the society. We could say much more um, because uh, ultimately uh, the church uh, provided um, a model for absolute power uh, but in that model for absolute power centered in the church, it also became a threat to personal monarchies. Let me mention the conciliar movement in the late medieval church that stood for the idea that the real authority of the church was not vested in one person and, or one bishop, the pope, but in all of the bishops together. So the con uh, Council of Constance in 1414 to 1418 deposed the three rival popes of that time and ended a scandalous epoch in church history declaring that the council's authority uh, came directly from Christ and that all men, including the Pope, were subject to the authority of Christ, uh, subject to the authority of Scripture in questions of faith and church reform. The movement did not last and the principle of monarchy eventually, of course, triumphed within the Roman church. Paradoxically, it was this frequent conflict between the church and state that contributed to the evolution of a political theory that emphasized governmental limitation and responsibility. The final piece of this whirlwind tour of the Middle Ages of the medieval period is to consider what was happening in Christian thought and the influence that classical thought was having upon Christian thought. The syncretism, the integration of thought made it easy for Greek and Roman thought forms to creep, uh, to creep into uh, the cracks of faith. Faith was coming to depend less and less on the Bible and more and more on the authority of the church. And Aquinas especially, we can date Aquinas 1225 to, to 1274 AD, Aquinas especially opened the door to placing revelation and human reason 
on an equal footing. We'll say much more about that when we study the Enlightenment. But with uh, Aquinas, we have uh, the reassertion of Aristotelian concepts um, as we think about a contrast that we will also study in some more detail between Aristotelian thought and Platonic thought. So ultimately, the Middle Ages were born with an awakened cultural and intellectual life and increasing piety. But as the church moved away from biblical teachings and as various biblical doctrines were distorted, as the church and uh, state uh, found themselves closely aligned, uh, soon we have European thought divided into two lines. <coughs> Excuse me. And both of those have an influence in our particular time. The humanistic elements of the Renaissance are one of those two thought forms, and the biblical foundations of the Reformation are the other. So we need to say something briefly about the Renaissance in this first period uh, of uh, study. And as we begin the second uh, session uh, next week, we will say something more uh, about the Reformation and we'll survey the Reformation. <coughs> Excuse me again. In the Renaissance, uh, we find uh, the, a word that means rebirth, but we must not think that everything prior was completely dark, uh, or, uh, nor must we think that uh, everything in the, the rich period of the Renaissance uh, functioned for good and the advancement of humanity. Uh, there was a rebirth in the Renaissance, but it was as much a rebirth of a concept about human capacity and human worth as it was an actual rebirth of uh, the human experience. Thinking about uh, the roots of the Renaissance, in the last half of the 11th century and into the 12th century, there was a time of economic expansion. Uh, think about the Crusades. Uh, there was increasing trade with the Orient, uh, textiles, uh, political freedom in town halls, the emergence of universities offering an education that was not purely clerical, was not totally based in church doctrine. Uh, there was an emphasis on written languages and many other factors. There was a rebirth of humanity, as we've said, uh, but more than a rebirth of humanity, it was a rebirth of an idea about humanity. While the Renaissance is often dated as the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries, I would suggest that its philosophical antecedents begin much earlier, and I would turn again to Aquinas, uh, 1225 to 1274 AD, and especially to his view of mankind. Aquinas believed that the will was fallen, but not the intellect. This meant that people could rely on their human reasoning, drawing good and truth from whatever source, uh, including non-Christian philosophers. The result was that philosophy was gradually being separated from God's revelation of truth, that is, from the Bible, and eventually we see in comparing philosophy and religion that philosophy came to be an independent, autonomous discipline. A better understanding of the importance of this development can be seen in a brief review of the two distinct worldviews that were advanced uh, by Plato and by Aristotle three to four centuries before Christ. Plato emphasized the absolutes, the ideals. Uh, we might say that uh, the emphasis of Platonic thought was upon the abstract. And some of you may be familiar with the allegory of the cave. Aristotle focused on the real, the particular, the individual things, the individual persons. Now, as that contrast comes down to the time of Aquinas. Aquinas focused on the real, uh, individual things, and he brought that focus into the philosophy of the late Middle Ages and opened the door, as I see it, for a humanistic element to be added to the Renaissance. Uh, we have not time for a detailed look at this particular uh, contrast, but I think we need to try to understand it to the extent we can. For understanding the contrast between Aristotelian thought and Platonic thought determines where one begins in the search for the meaning of life. Very simply put, it is a question as to whether faith seeks understanding, that we begin with some focus upon 
uh, absolutes and ideals and with faith in that absolute then seek understanding or whether we begin with understanding and from understanding seek faith. Uh, one uh, might decide to describe that contrast as between the higher story and the lower story. The higher story would include God and God's grace, unseen things, and the concept of the unity of the universals. The lower story focuses on the created world in which we live, nature, uh, that which is visible, and the diversity of individuals. So the question again is, where is one to begin? Beginning with the individual, one has no way to arrive at universals or absolutes. And the result then, as we think about the impact of Aquinas, the result was that the humanism of the Renaissance moved steadily toward modern humanism, that is, a value system rooted in the belief that man is his own measure, autonomous and totally independent. Now, I'm not trying to say that everything that happened during the time of the Renaissance was, was bad. Um, there were some great advances as a result of the focus on human ability and human capacity, human enjoyment. In 1340, Petrarch uh, climbed a mountain just to, just to have climbed it. Uh, architecture began to change dramatically. The arch developed. But the point is that the human being was at the center of experience. Uh, musically, orchestration was developed. Michelangelo's David is a good example of changes in sculpture. But um, I'm not sure this is the David of the Old Testament, but rather is man becoming great in and of himself, um, tearing himself out of the rock victorious. It is the time of Da Vinci, the first modern mathematician. The ultimate impact was complete faith in man or of human beings capable of solving everything. That was the ultimate outcome of the victory of Aristotelian thought over Platonic thought in the West. And so to summarize what we have seen in this whirlwind tour of the first 1500 years of Christian history, I think there are seven at least, probably more, but I will uh, simply name seven, seven potential trouble spots that um, deserve our attention uh, as we continue our historical survey uh, in the next couple of weeks. The first point to be made is that the possibility of an absolute objective value system that is not based upon human ability to think, to observe, to experience, or to understand uh, must be a factor. Is it possible that truth exists whether I understand it or not? Is it possible that there is an objective, absolute truth and that my understanding of that truth is not a necessary element of the existence of that truth? Or, more in keeping with the thought of the Enlightenment, must revelation, God's revelation, be understood by human reason in order to be valid? So that contrast between an absolute value system, that contrast uh, between an abstract, uh, absolute ideal and the reality that we can see and that we can experience uh, will continue to be in play uh, in the development of the Reformation. The second factor that I would uh, mention is the relationship between the church and state. What is an appropriate relationship between the church and state? What is an appropriate relationship uh, between the, the social system uh, and the church that exists in one sense within the social system, but in another sense outside the social system? A third element is how um, spiritual understandings, including the Bible, and secular factors or secular elements, including humanistic elements, are to be integrated or are to be separated. Um, and then fourth, what is the nature of the Bible? Uh, must the Bible somehow be mediated through the church or through human thought or through human analysis? Or does the Bible stand with some level of authority uh, above all human beings, whether it's understood or not? Uh, how does 
of the, the Word of God function? What is the nature of the authority of the Bible? Number five, uh, we must keep in mind the alliance or the conflict between philosophy and theology. Number six, uh, through this first 1,500 years of history, uh, we must at least be aware of the fact that the church was very slow to study itself and to develop a biblical ecclesiology. Uh, part of the problem that developed in Roman Catholicism was uh, the lack of focus, the lack of emphasis, the lack of study upon how the Bible itself, how the New Testament itself, describes the church. What is the church? And how does the church fit into God's purpose? And how does the church fulfill God's purpose? And that was a matter that had not been seriously considered. And then finally, we will have to come to grips with the capacity or the incapacity of the human being. And that will be especially a question related to whether or to what extent human beings can participate or cooperate in salvation. It will become a significant element in the Reformation. Uh, must human beings have divine revelation, uh, some uh, extra help from God uh, prior to understanding the Bible, or do human beings have the ability to understand the Bible? And we will come again to the thinking of Aquinas and try to understand how his thinking influenced the development of the Reformation. So these seven factors, uh, it seems to me, are unresolved as we come through 1,500 years of history. Uh, and, and to some extent, at least a large number of them remain unresolved during the time of the Reformation. And I would suggest to you, as we begin to uh, move later in this series to Restoration history, that some of these same factors were not clearly in mind and were not well resolved as we come to the, the Restoration. So there we have more or less uh, a brief survey of the first 1,500 years of uh, church history, uh, thinking about Rome as one of six uh, ecclesiological centers, six uh, cultural centers uh, during the time of the New Testament and shortly thereafter. Um, we can uh, think about the influence of the Greeks We've tried to understand a little bit of Platonic thought and Aristotelian thought. Uh, we've come to uh, briefly survey the Renaissance and, and give a, a general understanding of the importance of the Renaissance. And in the next uh, class, we will come to the Reformation and we will study in more detail uh, the Reformation in a survey fashion. Uh, think about some of the groups in the Reformation, the, the Catholic Counter-Reformation, but especially how the Reformation began to alter political structures, uh, the impact of the Enlightenment, and how the Reformation set the stage for and contributed to the Restoration. Thank you very much for your presence. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share, and uh, we will have some, as I've said before, discussion with those of you who are a part of the class, uh, but not a part of this official video. Thank you for joining us. I look forward to seeing you for the second lesson the next time that we're together. God bless.